we don't have a name for this show. Nothing. It's like, I swear, I swear, we should do a straight interview. So, all right, <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> all right, what's going on? This is Lawrence Brown. I have the great pleasure. I, and I actually should have asked this before because I keep is it LeBron or LeBron? LeBron. LeBron. Ah, so like I've been LeBron doing it James. wrong. Okay, I've been doing it wrong. <laughs> All right. Good day, everyone. This is Lawrence Brown. I have the great pleasure of interviewing today Mishan LeBron, um, a great actor, one of the great actors of our time, in my estimation. And uh, Mishan, you've had like this arc of plays where you've played Tupac, you've played Stokely, and now you're playing a black cop Yes. in this uh, production called Spook. So I just wanted to talk to you, like, what, you know, what was your thinking behind, you know, this arc, this portrayal of, like, these interesting black men? Oh, man. Well, I, I always wanted to, to do some kind of a theatrical series of, of what it means to be a black male in America. And... Uh, to just show the highs and the lows and the struggles that we as black men go through in America. And I wanted to put that in a theatrical setting. And um, when I was graduating from FIU, one of the things you had to do, you had to put on your own show. You had to basically write it, act in it, you had to design it, the lighting and all of that. And uh, they gave you a crunch time of like practically a, a few weeks to put all that together. Right. And um, they wanted you to go ahead and find someone that you really greatly admired. And the first person that popped in my mind was Tupac Shakur. You know what I mean? Right. I grew up listening to his music and everything. And uh, I wanted to set him being incarcerated at Clinton Correctional with a few days before he's to be released and to go into the waiting arms of Suge Knight. <laughs> 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 um, but I wanted to... Uh, uh, Kind of like question Trump goes in the way Norma Putin. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't even going to touch that. We all see what's happening. But, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? And uh, But I wanted him to be able to work out what his decision was going to make. You know, being at the crossroads, being able to be released. Should he go with death row or should he go on his own path of really enlightenment and... Um, awakening the minds of his people and liberating his people and uh, I wanted to show that conflict between him and the young black male and Richard III which was one of Tupac's favorite plays Tupac the writer and Shakespeare the writer showing that parallel the similarities between these giants um, which is also the same genius and, and giants that's living within all of us as young black males those that are considered the least desirable monsters, thugs, nothings, nobody, but that there is brilliance and genius in all of these young black boys and young black girls as well walking around the United States. I wanted to display that. And then Stokely Carmichael came to mind. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine brought it to my attention. He said, you need to do something on Stokely Carmichael, man. You sound and look just like him. My five-year-old daughter, I showed her old footage of brother Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, and I said, who is that? She said, Michon. So you need to do that. If the baby looks at that and recognizes that by looking at the black and white video, brother, you need to do it. And sure enough, I went on ahead and wrote that, and I want to show that brother what he was up against in 1966 when he first unveiled what is now known, we all know, as black power, you know, and basically what is black power. And what it meant, what it meant for us as young black males or black males in America, and what he had to go through to get to where he became for us, you know. And so, you go from that to right now. What we have is spook about this brother who is an extreme idealist, and um, he believed he wanted to do more than just protest. He wanted to be a part of uh, the solution to the problem. So he wanted to don the uniform, the badge, and the gun. But with that, I sh you will see in the play <laughs> how you can't do it on your own. You have to have the backing of your people. And for this brother, he cracked. And so he turns his sights on five of his fellow brothers and sisters in blue. And at the start of the, the play, we catch him on death row, but actually in the execution chamber one hour before his execution giving a live interview 
in front of the witnesses, which is the audience, and the clock is ticking down to the end of that hour. Hopefully, he will get a stay of execution. We don't know, but you will get a fantabulous <laughs> interview and, and in a way, in a way, um, confession uh, from this brother, Daryl Spook Spokane, on why he did what he did. Yeah, I was, um, I mean, the play is very provocative. It's, it's very thought, it's very probing. Uh, when I saw Stokely and I see this play, I think about, like, you delve into, like, the psychology yes. of black masculinity, I yes. think, very deeply. Yes. And so it's, it definitely, I want to see it again because the reflections that I've had, and even thinking about the profession of being a black cop in yes. America, Yes. That that your play really illuminated, you know, what I think a, a lot of cops that are black have to be going through. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and they go through it. Uh, I went through it uh, being a, a former uh, MPD police officer. Um, you, MPD being? MPD, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, police Department. And um, you're, you're out there. Now, now granted, where, where I served, it wasn't... Uh, well, predominantly black. It was actually predominantly white, um, very affluent. But then there's a lower part of that district where, where you have the, the club scene and where all the folks from Southeast go to party. They party downtown. They, club, they go to the club areas. And there you come in contact with the brothers and sisters that are out having a good time, mostly all out to have a good time and go home. But then you have those that let out their aggression, they let the alcohol take over, they let the drugs take over. And here you come to try to keep the peace. And so now you know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. You know why they're partying. Mm -hmm. Their partying is not just because, oh, it's Friday and I just want to let it blow off some steam. There's something else in there, which, which is the fact that I am an undesirable, I am an African American, and I have this struggle going on. Now, some people will say, well, that's just a made-up thing. There is no more oppression. There are no chains on you. You can go wherever you want and get any kind of job. Yes and no. <laughs> because the sting and the pangs of slavery and 100 years of uh, American apartheid and lynching and American terrorism is still with us. Unlike our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, we had uh, uh, places where they can go to heal. They had reparations. Even to this day, there's a book called Mouse that comes out to teach people how to deal with the Holocaust. Not those that actually went through it, but their children, their grandchildren, and their great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They have that, whereas we still don't even have a nation to really own up <laughs> to slavery. So when you're out there and you're seeing these folks out there with chips on their shoulders, it's not just some wild, feral <laughs> Negro. There's, that's a person there, or there's, there's generations of a wound that has never been healed. The fact that some of our sisters out here still feel... It's not their fault, but they still feel in order to be beautiful, they have to put on the hairstyle of the person that oppressed them. Nobody talks about that. That right there, you're looking dead in the eyes of, of abuse. There's never been reconciled. There's never been healed. And it, 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 it boggles my mind how people don't see it. And if you even bring that up, that little example up, well, you're wrong. So then as a police officer coming in with that kind of knowledge, you, you're, you're trying to find a way to get through all that red tape to get them from fighting one another, to get them from cutting one another, to get them from shooting one another. And you know that's not their nature, but that was something that was deposited within them. And then when you're trying to stop it, oh, you know, N-word, you know, get your... You know, you punk so and so, get your, your you know, you sell out, you know, you coon, you know, and you just trying to keep these brothers from killing each other, or from the other person from coming, who may be racist as, as hell, and you don't really know about it, but then it starts coming out of them, and they're not trying to talk to you, they're not trying to be nice to you, they're not trying to be diplomatic, they want to get it on, not all, but quite a few, quite a few. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> that are out there like that. Mm. You know, the I, when I think of your work, I think about uh, Amiri Baraka and the sort of revolutionary theatrical production, like Slave Ship. Yeah. You know, and it, the Slave Ship puts you in the Slave, <laughs> slave Ship. ship. <laughs> um, and so it's like, I, I like in your productions, yeah, I love it too. I, I, I think in your productions, you put people in you know in public health i talk about historical trauma yes which you i think you just alluded to this notion that you know this unresolved trauma right there hasn't been healing there hasn't been um you know the ability to you know have the mental culturally congruent mental health services for us right whatever that means absolutely. and whatever that should look like absolutely and so you know to what degree do you think your work you know does put the 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 participant, the audience, like in like this sort of place where trauma is raw. I, I think that the, the, the plays, I, I want them to try to heal. I want them to heal. Hmm. And I think that it's kind of shock treatment. I believe that it it's is. shock treatment to, to, to jolt, to get you to wake up and, and to, for you to pay attention and for you to say, wait, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? What's happening here? You know what I mean? I feel that if you see that, then you will walk out of that theater with that. You'll be left with those images. You'll be left with those things that were said. Maybe you got your friend. Maybe you got your lover with you. And you can leave out and y'all can discuss it. And that what you heard and what you said will remain with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that when, it, when it's there and you're paying attention, you have to take action. Some kind of way you're going to have to take action by doing something. Uh, talking to some more people about it. Maybe even in some cases, maybe you feel like you may need to actually go see a counselor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Man, what he's talking about there in the play, I'm actually going through on my job. Maybe I need to go talk to somebody about that. That stuff has been really bothering me. Maybe I need to talk to a, a friend. Maybe I need to talk to an elder about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Let me talk to this elder about what he just talked about uh, with Stoker Carmichael. Or let me talk to this police officer mm -hmm. about what I just saw here in Spook. And mm -hmm. do black police officers, are they really going through anything? Mm -hmm. Because for some of us on the other side, we don't think that they're going through anything. We think that they're just out there to collect a check, that they don't care about us, that they're showing out for other white officers. But I, I can tell you, most of the black officers that are out there, we understand the struggle. We know what's happening. You know what I mean? And we want you to be safe. But at the same time, we have to do our job. We're not going to let you sit up there and tear up everything. You know what I mean? Because our job is to keep that from happening. We're not going to let you kill each other either. We're going to stop that from happening. And if we come on the scene and there is a shooting, this whole business about, you know, uh, don't talk to 12, F12, don't say nothing to You are protecting the same bastard that's sitting up there wreaking havoc. So what's the what's the difference between what's the difference between the 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 the, the, the white terrorists mm -hmm. coming into the neighborhood, mm -hmm. clan a Nazi, mm -hmm. tan up the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and the brother over in, in the corner, part of the gang that's tan up the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna sit up here and, and, and justify yourselves by protecting that? Mm -hmm. Violence is violence. If our grandmothers and our daughters and our sons are out here in the neighborhood and they can't live. Because you got some knucklehead. Look at the little sister that just got killed over mm -hmm. there. And the, the officers went over there trying to look for the for the bastards that did that. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Everybody talking about something fucked well. Wait, y'all had a young girl <laughs> killed here in D.C.? Yeah, just a couple we of We just had one killed in Baltimore. I know, the young the little sister that just yeah, died. In, uh, in Baltimore. Yeah. And they're going through the neighborhood trying to figure right. out who did it. Right. They got video footage of these bastards jumping out of a car shooting. They go over there, they're asking questions. Everybody know who did it. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Nigga, you crazy. You, mm -hmm. oh, you crazy. You, you are psychologically damaged. And that mm -hmm. devil is in your mind. Mm -hmm. The same one that's sitting up there passing legislation. You let him control you because you let these bastards walk around. Mm -hmm. And you're not saying that, that baby girl is dead. Not coming back. Because these fools want to get out and be Rambo or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Terrorizing the same neighborhood. Like Tupac said, you know, they release these folks. And they release them in our neighborhood. Like we get along with the killers and we proving them right by not saying nothing because we call that snitching. Come on, man. That shit, I, I heard that, man. That shit, that shit broke my heart, man, because I know officers over there and they so frustrated. They're just like, what the hell with it? In Baltimore, some of the officers are like, I don't give a damn. Let them kill each other. They said them, the shootings done skyrocketed over there. Officers are not, they're not walking around. They're not 
talking to people. Mm -hmm. They don't want to get to know none of the citizens. The call come out, and then they what happens is they take their time mm -hmm. going to the scene. Mm -hmm. They round the corner. Mm -hmm. So it's like it, it goes both ways, man. There's there's accountability and responsibility on the officer's part to be human beings and to deal with each situation accordingly. Mm -hmm. But it's also the responsibility of those of us that are in neighborhoods that are being plagued with violence to do our part. They say that there's no black men in our communities no more. They say they ain't, they are, they're all in jail. Well, that's a lie. We got a lot of them in, in our community. The problem is, is some of us, some, not all, some of us are acting impotent and not saying nothing. Mm -hmm. You got these 15, 16 year olds when we were coming up, mm -hmm. you could not even curse out in public mm -hmm. because the elders, whether they're female or male, will pull you to the side and say, boy, what's wrong with you? And someone would knock you upside the head. Mm -hmm. They weren't scared of their children. Now we sit up here scared to death of the walking dead. To hell with that. At some point, you got to put it on the line and say life or death. But my people are not going to be terrorized, even if they look like us, because those are the worst traitors. You deal with the traitors in your neighborhood before you even think about fighting the enemy. That's real. And until we start getting into that mindset, man, we're going to continue to have these heartbroken stories. Although I think the sister was seven years old mm -hmm. that died. You got the sister over here that's 10 years old that died. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. We should be we in outraged over the over number five, but we ain't outraged over that. Mm -hmm. We outraged over what the Chicago police officers did. They shot the brother and then found out the brother did. It was, um, these motherfuckers, sorry. They, I'm sorry, I'm, mm -hmm. I get passionate. But they sitting up here protesting that. But nobody ain't protesting and all in the streets because this sister done got killed. Nigga, please, man. That, that, is, that is madness, man. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is madness. And, and, and stuff like that, that I saw on the street and hearing about and, and hearing from other officers, you know, that made me want to write spook. To put that out there, so you have this this officer, Daryl Spook Spokane, who's so fragile, who cares so much about his people, you know, that it, it breaks him. He, he feels like there's no place where he can go. There's no place to turn. Even in the play where he talks about Frank Boogie Baby, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, who tries mm -hmm. to give him some advice. And even that advice mm -hmm. is like, it's advice. But it's almost a, an advice of like, what do you do? Your hands are tied, so I throw my hands up. Like even even in that situation, man. And you do you know when I wrote that, I didn't really discover that until I started rehearsing. I wrote it, but until studying that monologue about Lady Liberty, mm -hmm. I was just like, wow, you know, is this really where we are? Because if we are where we are then the end result of what Spook Spokane did, that is an inevitable outcome. And what is that outcome? Death. The whole world coming apart and, 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 and everything being washed away. No life, which is love, but death, which is hatred. So what, what are we comfortable with? That's what we want? If that's what we want, guess what? That thing gonna be served up on a golden platter, and everybody gonna have to take a bite of that. I myself don't want to take a bite, but hey, man, we could talk all day, all day, <laughs> but all day. About I really business. appreciate the appreciate work that you. you do. I appreciate the way that you cause the audience to reflect on many of these tough issues. And uh, yeah. tell folks before we go um, the remaining production dates, the remaining times they can come. Oh check out man, so you you can check out the show. What's today? Today's Thursday? Yep. Good God, I got a show today. <laughs> I got a show today, July, was it 19th? Thursday at 6.30, Capitol Fringe at uh, the Violet Room at the Arena Stage. Um, I have a show on uh, July 21st, Saturday at 5.30 at the Violet Room Arena Stage. This is all with the Capitol Fringe Festival. And our last show is July the 26th at 6 p.m. at the Violet Room at the Arena Stage, capitalfringe.org. You look for Spook, click on that, get that ticket. Come on out, the tickets are only $17. You could come on out here. You could look for me, Michonne LeBron on Facebook. 
on Instagram. You can look for Spook on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And SpookPlay.com is our website. You can come on there, learn some more about the show. Um, we've received rave reviews. The people are loving it, and I think you'll love it too. Uh, you said Amari Baraka. I met that brother before he passed, and I told him I was going to continue to carry that baton. He passing it over to me, so I got it, and I'm running with it. That strong black theater that that brother wrote in strong black poetry, your boy Michelle LeBron doing it. That's right. That's right. Thank you once again, man. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh,